President Trump promised to drain the swamp, as he put it, when he was running for office and since he was inaugurated. But a number of top officials in his cabinet and administration have come under sharp scrutiny. One cabinet head that is getting more attention of late is the Secretary of Commerce, Wilbur Ross. Amna Devaz has a look at the ethics concerns about Mr. Ross's own finances and meetings while in office. Judy, last week, the acting director of the U.S. Office of Government Ethics sent a letter to Secretary Ross criticizing the Commerce Secretary for failing to fully divest stocks by January 15, 2017, 18 months after Ross agreed to do so. The letter stated, quote, your failure to divest created the potential for a serious criminal violation on your part and undermined public confidence. Ross has since admitted to inadvertent errors and announced he's finally sold all equity holdings, but questions about the timing of Ross's actions as secretary related to his personal wealth remain. Dan Alexander of Forbes has been covering the story, and his reporting was cited by the Office of Government Ethics in that letter last week. He joins me now. Dan Alexander, welcome to the News Hour. I want to ask you about some of your latest reporting. You look specifically at Secretary Ross's calendar, specifically the time between February and November of 2017. Those were his first few months in office. What about that time raised red flags for you? Well, we started looking through it, and immediately you can see that there are dozens of meetings with companies in which Secretary Ross had financial interests or ties to the company. There are also meetings with foreign leaders that have oversight over businesses that he owned at the time, and there are also meetings with sovereign wealth funds that had previously pumped millions of dollars into Secretary Ross's private equity funds. So let's look specifically at one day, for example, May 18, 2017. You detail in your reporting. It's a busy day for the secretary. He has meetings with foreign officials, a trade hearing, some calls. There's one lunch that you hone in on, one that lasts longer than any other meeting, and it's a lunch with the CEO of a rail car manufacturer called Greenbrier Companies. Why is that significant? So shocking when we saw it on the calendar. You can see it's listed as lunch with Wendy and Bill Furman. And if you look and see who Bill Furman is, you can see that he's, as you said, the CEO of Greenbrier Companies. And Wendy appears to be Wilbur Ross's Secretary of Staff. So it looks like there are three people in this meeting. One's the CEO of Greenbrier, one's Wilbur Ross, and the third is, appears to be Wendy Terramoto. Now, at the time, Wilbur Ross had a secret interest in Greenbrier, which he had never disclosed to ethics officials. And he had that interest while he was having this meeting. In addition, Wendy Terramoto also had a financial interest in Greenbrier. So you've got three people at the meeting. Two of them have undisclosed to the public interests in the company that the third person is running. What they discussed about is going to be a question that a lot of people are wondering. The Commerce Department says it was all friendly, but it's hard to imagine that they didn't get into any business topics at all. And also, as part of your reporting, you mentioned in there you found out Greenbrier had been lobbying uh, for renegotiations of NAFTA, and then we saw action from Secretary Ross's office that same day. Is that right? Yeah, the meeting starts at uh, 12 noon, and at 11.59 a.m., Secretary Ross puts out a statement that he's going to be renegotiating NAFTA on behalf of Donald Trump. And as you said, Greenbrier had been actively lobbying other parts of the federal government to make changes to NAFTA at that point for months. So he didn't disclose the interest in that one company. He did disclose, however, interest he held in a private equity fund, uh, one whose single biggest investment is actually a company that builds ships in China. What's the ethical conflict there? So this is a company that you're referring to, which is called Nautical Bulk Holding. This was another one, actually, that he did not divest originally. He just, he just, excuse me, did not disclose originally. He just disclosed that he had the fund, but you have to disclose all of the underlying holdings of the fund. And that, that biggest interest, as you said, was to make ships in China. And at the time, Wilbur Ross is one of Donald Trump's lead lieutenants in what is now the ongoing trade war between the United States and China. So you've got a guy whose financial interests are positioned to benefit from trade in China at the same time that he's negotiating over trade in China. 
Dan, let me ask you this, because we asked Secretary Ross's office for comment. They pointed us back to that uh, July 12th letter we cited in the introduction here. They basically cited a part that said, look, although uh, this is the Office of Government Ethics to his office, that his actions could have run him afoul of criminal conflict of interest law, but that they found a review of the calendars, his briefing books and correspondent, that he wasn't in any such violation of that law. They also pointed us to uh, a part of their department statement, the Commerce Department statement, in which they said, quote, the vast majority of the holdings described in the story have been sold by Secretary Ross, and he has committed to sell the remainder. So does that solve the problem? No, it does not solve the problem. There are a couple of things there. First of all, the letter was looking at the interests that he held after he had said that he was going to divest them. So that means companies like Greenbrier, which we mentioned earlier. It does not say that they looked at all of his meetings overall, and there were other meetings with companies in which Ross and his wife had interests at the time of those meetings. So those sorts of meetings are the thing that federal investigators would want to look at as well. And the fact that he's now saying that he's in the process of divesting some of them or that he's divested some of them already, that does not absolve him of the fact of what he did at the time that he owned those, uh, those companies. So this is not a, you know, a source-based sor story. You can just look at the calendar and look at his disclosures. You see what he owns, you see what his meetings were, and you can see that there's clear overlap. And people will be looking at that whether or not he's out of those companies at this point or not. So, Dan, very quickly, there's a line here, obviously, between something that looks bad and something that is bad, right, between unethical right. and illegal. Where does Secretary Ross seem to be on the line? And if it's, there's some larger concern, who holds him accountable? So there are uh, several different legal issues here, but with many of the legal issues, the line is whether he was sloppy and made mistakes in not divesting of these things or whether he intentionally lied to federal officials saying that he had divested them. Uh, it's very difficult to believe that a guy who's known as one of the smartest investors in the United States could have simply forgotten about, for example, a $10 million plus dollar stake that he still held in his former employer. Uh, but that's what Ross says, and he says that with several other interests as well. It's, it's hard to get inside people's heads, but that's what people will be trying to do to figure out whether uh, those were lies or whether those were a series of mistakes. Dan Alexander of Forbes, thanks for your time. Thank you.